We're in Palm Springs, we're about to go interview Adam Steltz and that. I've been trying to get hold of him for months. I managed to get hold of him and it's going to be funny turning up to meet this guy for the first time and I'm just going to be like a sweating pot. Adam Stelsner, the chief engineer of the Mark Curiosity Rover project. T minus five, four, three, two, one. Main engine start, zero, and lift off. So I'm Adam. <laughs> um, I grew up in Sausalito, California. I have a PhD in engineering physics, but my route to that final degree destination was sort of maybe slightly circuitous. I was not a very good student in high school. I didn't really know if I'd ever graduated because they kept your diploma back and you were to go after the graduation ceremonies and pick it up. And I needed to get a C minus or better in John Lighty's environmental chemistry class or I was not going to graduate high school. And I didn't know if I'd gotten a C minus or better. Um, so I never went back to pick up the di diploma because I was worried it wouldn't be there. Um, at any rate, I played music, uh, went to music school in Boston at a place called the Berkeley College of Music for a little bit, bailed on that because I was still not really engaging. I went to music school, I bailed out of music school, I came back to San Francisco Bay Area, I was playing in a few different bands playing around the Bay Area. And I was getting bored of it. Anyway, I'd, I'd, I had actually started to notice that when I would return home from playing a show at night, the stars were in a different place in the sky. What were you thinking when you were looking at the stars? I was thinking, whoa, they're moving. Why do they move? I mean, I really had not been paying attention in high school. That's kind of a big thing to miss, <laughs> right? <laughs> that the Earth is rotating on its axis. And so I literally, I went to the local community college to take an astronomy course to teach me why the stars were moving. And all of a sudden, I was ripe for a structured education. I was just on fire. What, what had changed between high school and then, and then that? I think before, I had always been worried about trying anything, really applying myself. Okay. My father was clearly scared to fail, so he would dabble in lots of different things, but never really, when it would come to the moment of truth, he'd back off and pick up another thing. And that's kind of like what I had done. I did music at the tail end of high school and after high school. And then when that was about to get, get serious at music school, I pulled out of that. And finally I decided I didn't want to keep doing this. I didn't want to rep replay the, the actions that my father had gone through. I wanted to really do something. Can I ask a question around the crazy transition that you've had with like the whole education thing? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. What was it for you that just like, you know, was like this is gonna be like what I'm gonna study for the rest of my life? Yeah, this is gonna sound very strange. It was very simple. It was F is equal to MA. That there was a simple equation that determined how hard you had to push on something to make it change its state of velocity, that blew my mind. F is equal to MA, and then A is equal to F over M. It was so simple, it was beautiful. Look at those little letters, there's just three of them. They're pretty. And they do different, you know, whoop, whoop, teaches you something different, and whoop. And I was like, Oh, wizard of mathematics, <laughs> teach me the incantations that you use to manipulate the symbols to show you the truth. F is equal to MA, it's an awesome thing. I love it. Did you know you were good at math? Not at first. And so there's like probably a year here of transition. And actually, that's a very interesting time to talk about. I'm deciding I want to try this, and I'm not any good at it. I had to hold on to the act of trying I had to surrender to the act of doing rather than the promise of success or something on the, at the end of it. Sort of surrender to the process rather than the goal. And so working through this stuff and getting C's and then eventually B's in my math courses in the beginning was very hard. So how were you motivating yourself? I mean, obviously it was tough. Yeah, so how did you I, keep going? I felt that I was saving my life from not trying like my father had not really tried. And then I just started working, you know, and then I tried really hard to, really hard 
I worked really hard. And for my undergrad, I became very monk-like. I literally shaved my head. I became like, because I grew up in the Zen Center zone, so everybody, oh, monks shave their head, that's what you do when you got monkish. So anyway, um, <laughs> all it was just like, what can I do? You know, what, what it's kind of how powerful might I be? I you know, got my master's, started my PhD. I'd met this woman in a math class at Caltech. And so I wanted to stay around there. She was still finishing her degree. And so I went and worked at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. What was your title at the time? I was analyst in the Spacecraft Structures and Dynamics Group. But I liked, I was comfortable with those weird problems, the ones that have the steep end of the learning curve. So I started to get the the weirder problems, the separation dynamics, the, the spin of jet, you know, weird mechanism functions and stuff. People go like, I give that to Adam. And so I started doing stuff like that. Eventually, that started the being involved in landings. So, EDL, we've got some Tweedo warnings. Stand by plane. Dynamics phase. Come back again with uh, risk of dynamics. And I got pulled into the Mars Exploration Rover, Spirit and Opportunity. And, and I led the mechanical engineering of the landing system for that. I saw in a, a talk you gave, you said, exploring the universe is also about exploring yourself. And I was wondering how that ties into you personally, how, how you can relate to that. Even where I've gravitated to at work is the high risk and most exposed you could be part of the job. And I am always somehow courting that edge to prove to myself that I'm not trapped in the fear. And I started to explore in my mind why we go to Mars with a huge rover. What I mean by that is if we put a smoking hole on the surface of Mars when we tried to land Curiosity. I would have definitely failed. My team would have not been successful, right? But I think humanity is better for trying that and making a smoking hole on the surface of Mars than never having tried. And so then that even forces me into thinking about exploration in the general sense, right? Like exploring yourselves. That's the process part, when you step back and look at what are we doing as human beings, right? So I would say don't put your value in success. Put your value in your effort. People that are thought of as being successful leaders, they were able to put their all into it and make something great happen. But there's people who put their all into it and make beautiful, great things happen that don't show up on the national radar screen or the world's radar screen and don't make as big of a splash. And if your happiness is w waiting for that big splash, it's, you're not, you're, it's gonna be hard to find happiness. So when you look back at your life, you remember the great highs and the great lows. The, the middle sort of does not stand out that much. So, Never fear risking the great lows in pursuit of the great highs.